um, for, for college. I went to Southern for a year, Southern Oregon, and then transferred to Portland State University because I was so tired of not being in a city, even though Ashland is beautiful. But uh, yeah, I needed an arts credit. So I took an improv class and then fell in love with it like immediately and kind of knew it was what I was supposed to be doing within like the first 10 minutes of that class. And uh, so I did improv for, you know, I did improv one and then two and then took some theater classes. And then I actually dropped out of college, which is maybe not the best thing to be saying to like a college <laughs> class, but, and then I dropped out and then uh, moved to Los Angeles when I was about 22, 23 years old, um, maybe even younger, maybe 21, 22, to study with the Groundlings, which is like a sketch comedy group down here. Um, because I wanted to get really serious about what I was doing. And at Portland State University, you know, they didn't really have an infrastructure. There wasn't, if there was a film school, it was very limited, you know, and it was uh, not, that's not what I wanted to be doing anyway. I wanted to do like improv and sketch comedy. So I moved down, did the first two levels of that. And then it was like a long wait to get into level three. So at that point, I just moved back uh, up to Portland and finished my degree and then got into stand up comedy. Um, but while I was in, as an undergrad, I, I took a lot of like, once I, my major was political science, but once I took those improv classes, that kind of led me down that path. Like I said, I took all the improv I could, I TA'd all the improv I could. I just really tried to sort of engross myself in it um, as much as possible and like spend as much time doing as I did learning, if that makes sense. That has been my, my huge, uh, or that has been my biggest experience. Like, or what am I trying to say here? Doing has been like as important as learning. I mean, it's good to learn. It's good to like learn the rules and learn the framework. I assume, especially in film, it's very important, but like there has been nothing uh, as important to me, whether it's been for me to learn how to do things or in, helping me get jobs that has been as important as doing. And for me, college gave me like a lot of time uh, to do. And like, you know, the student loans were f fucking crazy eventually. But like, while I was there, I was in the pocket and didn't, you know, have responsibilities other than like learning and doing. And that's kind of what I used my college time to do. Mm -hmm. I, I did finish my degree in political science, but like, to this day, I couldn't tell you anything except that the German parliament's name is the Bundestag. And for some reason, I remembered that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so you moved back up to Portland to finish your degree. And then when you moved back to LA, I was curious because I know a lot of us want to move down to LA and are yeah. curious about getting like, that's how we get our foot in the industry. So I was wondering if you could talk about like the benefits or like the challenges that you faced moving down to LA. Yeah, well, so I... You know, I have the two different experiences having moved to LA. The first time I moved to LA, like I said, it was just to do the Groundlings and I didn't know anyone and I didn't really have any friends who could help me out at all. I didn't have any connections, anything like that. And it was outside of uh, doing the Groundlings stuff, it was a little bit isolating and I felt a little bit unprepared for it. You know, I, I did as much Groundlings as I could I somehow got a job. I mean, this was uh, 10 plus years ago. I somehow got a job writing like sketches for some like website that wanted to make like, wanted to be like a YouTube competitor or something like that. Um, but I didn't have a lot of opportunities to perform or anything like that. Cause there weren't really the upper end citizens brigade had like an improv open mic, but it was really hard to get up and stuff like that. So that was the first time I moved down. And I spent my nights, honestly, I worked at P.F. Chang's, I did the Groundlings, and then every free night I would go to the Starbucks on the USC campus and I would like get the biggest coffee they had and I would just write all night. And then I would go back and refill the coffee and then just keep writing. And I would spend like three, four hours doing that every night for two reasons. A, because there was nothing better to do. I mean, I could go back to my house and play Madden, I guess. Uh, but I wanted to be around, you know, I was supposed to be in college. I wanted to be around kids my own age, even though I didn't talk to anybody, but it was just nice to be like surrounded by other college kids. Um, so that was the first time I moved down. And I will say like, I worked really hard and the Groundlings things were really important. And I did end up making connections like that. The second time I moved down, um, 
I was 28 years old. And at that point, I had been doing stand-up comedy for a few years, and stand-up had gone really, really well for me. Um, I got into a festival called Just for Laughs that is in Montreal, Canada, um, which was kind of like, and I was a new face at the, at the uh, festival, which was kind of like the NBA draft of stand-up comedy is like the best way I can describe it. You know, like, you're like, okay, we think you're good. We're going to give you opportunities. And then, you know, if you mess them up from there, that's on you. But at least we gave you an opportunity. Um, so then when I moved to Los Angeles, A, I had the connections I made on my own. And that was just from, uh, and I, I don't know how practical this advice is, seeing that I was a stand-up comedian. But like, um, you know, I would come to LA on my own and try to perform down here and make as many connections as I could uh, just on my own. So if I had, you know, like a spring break or just like a week off, I would take my money and I would fly down. And then I would just like try to engross myself in the, in the culture as much as possible, performing and meeting other comedians and everything. Um, so I had those connections. And then anytime anyone came up to Portland, I would have them on my show, uh, whether they were coming up from LA or coming from Austin, Denver, any of these other sort of like satellite cities that also had like an arts community. Um, so I had that. And then I had the connections I made from, uh, from Montreal, which I suppose would be like getting a film into like a festival somewhere, you know, where you go there and it's not LA, it's not New York, but it is a city where there are people from those places who can like, well, hey, you know, hey, I enjoyed your thing. Here's my card. Look me up if you get here. Um, and that's also where I got an agent. So the second time I moved to Los Angeles, I had representation. Um, I, I had friends, I, I had people I knew. Um, now, I don't know how practical this is for film. I assume, you know, I assume through your college, you also make connections and through like doing festivals and stuff like that. But I will say, uh, I was, the second time I moved down, I was really glad that I had those connections. It made it so much easier and it made me feel like I was able to make the most of my time down there. You know, I wouldn't trade the first time I moved down for anything, but like I was able to, the hard work I did, I was able to put into a direction that ended up like helping me out a little bit further down the line when I had like meaningful outlets for it. Uh, like, you know, where I could be like, oh, let me take a meeting with this person and pitch them a show idea. Or let me take a meeting with this person, you know, and like, they have like general meetings. And I assume this is true for film people too. It's called like a general where you just go in. That's, you have general meetings, right? My girlfriend's here. She's not a stand-up comedian, but she also works in TV and film. Um, so we go, like, you go in and like a general meeting is just where they're like, so tell me about you. Tell me the Ian Carmel experience, you know? It's Hollywood people, so they're full of shit. But they do have like, uh, they can help you out a little bit. And in those, you just, it's, it's schmoozing. You like tell them who you are. You learn a little bit about what their company does, whether or not there's somebody you want to be in business with. Um, so the second time I had a lot more opportunities to do that. Um, I think it is, I don't know if this is true in film, but definitely in stand-up comedy. I have seen people move down who had not, maximized what they could do in their own scene, had not taken full advantage of it. I, I don't want to say maximize because I could have stayed in Portland and like had like a local show on like, you know, one of the like cable networks or something like that. And I guess technically that would have maximized it. But like, it's good to use your local scene to build up as much speed as you want. When you make that jump to LA, you think, you know what I mean? You want to be like Thelma and Louise, except somehow you make it to the other side of the canyon. You know what I mean? Like, you want to build up as much speed as you can use because it's expensive down here. It is like, like it's expensive to live down here and it's expensive emotionally too, because you'll hike up to the top of Griffith park and you'll look out and you'll see all these buildings and like ur urbanity as far as the eye can see, just like civilization all the way into the ocean and then the other direction until your eyes stop working. And then you'll think to yourself, if things are going poorly, all those people are also trying to make it right now what hope do I have? Or if you do it when you've built up a little momentum for yourself and you have some opportunities, you'll think, you know, I'm like, you know, here I am, I'm in LA, I'm making it. And you'll have that fun, like look at the Hollywood sign. And then like when your favorite song starts playing in your head, like, so that like, depending on like how the view from Griffith Park goes, really depends on how you set yourself up. In my experience, 
before you make the big jump. You want to come to LA or you want to go to New York in my, again, in my experience with like a little bit of momentum with, with having done a little bit, you know, where you're at now in film, that might be completely different. Maybe it's a good idea right out of college. You have a chance to like intern at a studio or something like that. And that might be your version of me doing comedy in Portland for four years before I moved down. Um, but I was really, it, it, of the two times I moved down, I was, the second time was better. And it was because I had put more work in, if that makes sense. No, I think that is really applicable advice to cinema majors. I think that like utilizing the connections you have and where you have it is really, really useful. I'm graduating in June. So I'm thinking a lot about like how to kind of use what I have right now to like propel myself. Um, yeah. Yeah, every con every connection is good. Every like every person you meet who's like interested in it, I don't. And it's and it's fun because it's authentic too, in my opinion. I mean, you'll meet some people and it's going to be a shallow relationship, but like, I, I don't know. One of the things I loved when I was like around y'all's age and a little bit older <clears throat> was just like the excitement of like, I mean, the dopest thing about moving down and like, or just being around other people who take it seriously is finding other people who like take it seriously. Cause I'm sure you have people in your classes who are like taking those classes and you know what I mean? Like maybe you want to make like a, a film with them. You were like, let's make a, let's write a script. Let's fucking like put some lights on broom handles and let's like make that stuff. And like, you know, you're in classes with people who are going to become nurses and architects and like, you know, journalists and things that are wonderful things to be. And they're like, well, on Thursday, I want to go, I want to go see a movie. And you're like, no, on Thursday, let's make a movie. And they're not going to do it. They're going to go on a date. And like the coolest thing about coming down is like meeting those other people who are going to be like, you know, the grip and lighting and the sound person and like filming with you. And like, that's a really, that makes it all worth it. That part is beautiful. Mm. Um, sorry, I'm rambling. Go ahead. No, that's awesome. Um, I was curious, this is like specifically about you and not, um, advice to us but what are who are your or what are your influences for like your career and um your experience oh yeah absolutely i uh the person who got me into stand-up comedy i've met you know i've uh well i have met her now but like eddie izzard was the was the first person who made me fall in love with stand-up comedy i was uh i was in mexico with my family on a vacation when i was like 13 maybe 14 years old 15 years old because i was in high school and I, it was full of hubris. And uh, I drank the water unfiltered, which you're not supposed to do if you're like from America. And I let myself like stay out in the sun and get sunburnt. So all of my family was out enjoying Mexico and I was wrapped up on a blanket in the hotel room. And uh, her special Dress to Kill came on HBO. And oh my God, I like, it came on, I watched it. And then it came on again right after and I watched it again. And a decade before I knew I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, I fell in love with stand-up comedy. And ever since then, I have been trying to do something even like a quarter as smart as, as Eddie Izzard's comedy. So that's the person who just made me fall in love with comedy more than anything. Since I've been uh, working, like, I mean, Mel Brooks will always be, to me, like the funniest person who's ever existed. I, every movie he's done on DVD, I just love him. Uh, we're watching his Curb Your Enthusiasm season right now, which is also fantastic. Um, God, and then like, it's weird that I would like, there's people who I love and admire who I wouldn't consider my influence because I couldn't do what they do. Someone like Maria Bamford, you know, is amazing like that. Uh, but in late night, uh, like what Letterman did, like early Letterman, I, th I find amazing. Conan, all like everything Conan's ever done. Um, and then, God, I, I don't know. And since I've gotten into the business, I guess maybe I should have more like heroes and stuff like that. But like, I don't know. It's like, I'm just like so engrossed in what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis that I don't spend a ton of time thinking about what other people are doing. I watch every other late night shows, you know, big sketches and, and, and stuff like that. But I'm like, now I'm inspired by like what James Corden can do and how I can put him in a position to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully be done with work in time to do stuff like this. Like that's, that's like my favorite stuff right now. Uh, well, can you tell us a little bit about like what your a day looks like and now even remotely, like what does it look like to work for a <clears throat> show like that? Yeah. So 
right now, uh, we have our first meeting at 8.30 in the morning. And at 8.30 in the morning, me and three of the other writers will meet with James on Zoom uh, to go over news stories from the night before. So we will probably have 10 to 12 news stories in that meeting. Uh, then we will narrow it down to about nine. And it, it runs the gamut. We'll always cover the political stuff. Um, Probably the first four or five stories are going to be like the president did this, the house is doing this, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, so that will be the first part. The rest of them will be like, like funny, like Huffington Post weird news ass stories where it's like today it was uh, like a semi truck holding bees crashed in in San Antonio and a million bees flew out, you know, and like. It'll be like a story like that or like in Vegas, they built a three foot bong or like <laughs> things like that. The kind of things where you're like, your aunt will see it in a monologue and be like, I have to send this to him. You know, like that kind of, like those funny kind of news stories. We'll take that, we'll cut it down from like 12 to about nine. Then we'll take that and send it to all the monologue writers. Our staff is about 11 people, um, 11 writers. We'll all write on it from about nine o'clock to 10.45. Now that's right now. When we were in the studio, we would write for longer. Um, and while that's happening, I will write jokes as long as I can, but then I have to go to like production meetings. And like the first production meeting, it's our executive producers, it's the prop people, it's the, it's the head of the lighting department, it's the head of sound, it's all the uh, practical people in there. And we just go over what we're gonna shoot, uh, do on the show that day to make sure everybody's on the same page. This happens at 9.30 in the morning. We film at three right now. Um, so we run through the show, start at the monologue. Are there any graphic demands? Are there any prop demands that we can see coming from this point? Uh, then we go into act one, two, three, four, same thing. Are there any prop demands? Okay, this guest is in South Africa right now. So they need to do their interview at 1 p.m. So everybody's okay. You know, is James gonna be in wardrobe by then? Like all these like moving plates and it's everybody like at the top of their game. I often feel like I'm like the stupidest person in these meetings, but um, we do that. Then when the jokes come in around like 1130, oh, and then at 1030, we have what's called a creative meeting with Corden. And in the creative meeting, that's where, when you're writing in late night, when you're writing on like, whether it's late night or not, when you're writing on a daily show, uh, something where you have to, you know, film that day, and produce the show that day, you're always working on like three arcs. You're working on like, what has to be done today and on the show today? What are we doing next week? What are we doing, you know, what are we doing on Thursday? What are we doing next week? And that's like sort of a medium arc. And then you have like a large arc where something like, okay, The weekend wants to do something with us ahead of his Super Bowl halftime show. You know what I mean? Like, we need to bring in ideas right now because Corden needs to approve it. Then we need to get back to the weekends team. They need to approve it. We need to take their notes, incorporate it, make sure Corden likes it, and then take all that and give it to our COVID task force so they can say, yes, you can do this, or no, six backup dancers is too many. This is like a thing we're in the middle of right now. Like, uh, And then, so you need to be working on that long arc too. So in the creative meeting, you go over all that stuff. It's like, hey, on today's show, we're shooting this sketch over Zoom with Brian Cranston. Can you approve the final script? Yes, here it is, or no, I got notes. And then you gotta take that and you gotta fix it and bring it back, find the time to bring it back later. Um, or it's like, hey, Reese Witherspoon's gonna be on the show in a month. Here's a packet of 12 ideas from the writers. Pick the three you like and we'll pitch them to her and her team. And we'll start that process. So that happens in the creative meeting at 1030. That's usually like a 45 minute process. Um, then at 1130, I get the jokes from the monologue team. And then me, one of the other head writer or the other head writer, and then like uh, one of the producers, we check our jokes. Sometimes James does if he's not busy. We literally go through the packet. When we were in the studio, we'll check it with a pen. Now we bold them send that to a writer's assistant and they compile it and give that to the monologue team. And then they start putting together the monologue. And in the meantime, we're like, you know, punching up other writer scripts, giving notes, doing like some production and stuff like that. Um, and then we film at three. And then usually after the show, we have like more meetings and stuff like that. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a 
regular day. And when we were in person, it was that, but we'd be in the studio at nine and we would tape at five. So there'd be a little bit more room in the day uh, for table writing stuff, taking something that like a writer couldn't quite crack, sitting around like a table with it and, you know, like throwing ideas back and forth while a writer's assistant types it up on a laptop, like on a big screen that we have in front of us. Kind of the stuff you assume like is happening like in a late night room, that's when that would happen. Now with COVID, it's not really happening like that. Hopefully by next fall or whatever, we'll be back in the, fully in the studio. Although James is in the studio and up until winter break, I was also in the studio, but mm -hmm. hopefully we'll be back soon. Yeah. Um, you touched on it a little bit when you were talking, but I was wondering like how, and if you have thoughts about it, how you've seen COVID change the television and film industry and then like what you think that will do like long-term. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot more animated projects in development. Like <laughs> it's definitely been like, I have a friend who's like, does a lot of voiceover, you know, David, my friend, David who, mm -hmm. from the podcast, David Borey, who is the voice of Comedy Central and also a very talented stand-up comedian who does a lot of uh, voiceover work. He like told me that like, once COVID hit, he was getting like five times the amount of voiceover auditions and like cartoon auditions and animated stuff that he was getting before that. Um, you know, like in, in, in television and, and, and film as well, you have seen, there's that, I forget the name of the movie that just was on HBO Max where they like- A Locked Up or something? Locked Up, yeah. The whole thing is like we're in COVID. I don't know how many of those ideas are gonna sell frankly, or like really the go projects, because I don't know how many people are going to want to come back and relive this, you know, <laughs> like, I'm sure there's go and I'm sure there's going to be exceptions to that. And I'm sure there's going to be people who do it brilliantly. I'm sure there's going to be some very funny comedies. I forget which network, but I know that my fun, my friend Guy Branham was working on like a over zoom uh, pilot, I think like at ABC. And I think like, you know, the networks have been trying to figure out how to keep churning out new content in uh, in this environment. And I think it's uh, like admirable of them, but I think the long-term effect of this, I don't, this is just me guessing. I think they're going to want to get back to making TV the way everyone's been making TV, like as soon as possible. I think what maybe COVID has done to the industry is accelerated things that were already in motion. I think, uh, people creating their own content. I think like whether it be TikTok or YouTube or what, or, or uh, Twitch or whatever it is, I think has been sort of accelerated by this uh, because those are the people who are still able to make new content right now. Um, so I think it kind of accelerated that, but I still think like, I mean like this, so right before COVID hit, we were going to like, there was probably going to be a writer strike. And now I don't think there's going to be, I think, I think that's going to be averted. And I think we're not going to strike for quite a while. And I think that if you need to look for silver linings, I think that's definitely one of them. Um, but one of the points, and this is good, I think that for people who, I mean, you people who like, I don't want I say get into the industry, which is very much minimalized as being an artist, you know I mean, but like who want to work in this industry, like, one of the things the Writers Guild was saying was there are more outlets now than ever. You know what I mean? They're like, there's so many streaming platforms. All the traditional networks are still there. Like there can be a feeling like they're making less stuff. They're making more stuff than ever. There are going to be more jobs than ever. Gigantic fucking companies are getting involved in this stuff. You know what I mean? Like there's like Apple's making like content and like, you know, Amazon is making content. Neither of those are new, but like, now there's like Paramount Plus and they're going to need new content. Like all of these beasts are going to need to be fed. Um, so I think there's go there's going to continue to be work in this industry. Like all like the more and more people, even you saw Quibi, you know what I mean? Like it, it became a punchline. I have my own opinions about like why it failed and everything, but like that was still a lot of jobs for a lot of people for a little amount of time, but it was still like a lot of jobs for a lot of people. And there's still gonna be people trying to get involved in that right now, because it's a very gold rushy time. There are so many streaming platforms, you know, and they are all going to continue to need new content. 
right now, and right now, while the terrestrial networks and the cable networks are also going to need that content. So mm. I don't think COVID's going to like hurt the industry. Really, that's that's like my take on it. I think like any hurting of the industry was that's right now. You know what I mean? When they're not making as many shows like right now, but I think like in six months, twelve months, I don't I don't think you're gonna. I, I don't think you're going to see that many lasting repercussions of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think those are the big questions I had um, for Anne, but I wanted to open it up for questions from the group. You guys can put it in the chat or you can um, just start talking. And I'm not sure if you can raise your hand in this Zoom, but yeah. I was just curious. This is a bit of a like more abstract question. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm I'm just so curious as to like what your creative process looks like and how do you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I can talk about it from two angles with with like projects for me, stand up comedy, or like if I'm if I'm putting together like a pilot or whatever. Usually that creative process will look like me uh, either writing like thoughts in a notebook that I keep with me or lately texting myself ideas and then like having a compilation of like 30 different ideas that I've thought of about like one topic and then eventually putting those in like a Google doc, you know, and then like trying to synthesize that into something. Um, and that has always kind of been my process with stand up comedy as well It's just is having funny things occur to me and then collecting those thoughts like I'll be like you know you'll be up for a walk or like before in the before time you'd be at a restaurant or at a coffee shop or whatever and like a funny notion would occur to you and then I like to sit down for like two or three hours and then just like really try to ride on it like as much as I can you know and for stand-up that would be like writing almost in a stream of conscious form uh, or when it comes to scripted or putting together like a pitch you know, there's more of a framework to it. Um, for late night, the creative process is very demand-based. It's it's like, here's the news story. You know, I'm sure tomorrow we'll be writing jokes about Donald Trump putting together the office of the former president. So, you know, like, there's the news story. The creative process is, think of 10 funny jokes about this news story. Or the demand will be, um, uh, I'm trying to, like, Who's somebody who has a movie coming out? There are no movies. There's no movies. So many, like, I don't know who's in the King Kong <laughs> Godzilla movie. Like, let's just say, like, again, Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston has a movie coming out. It's about a 50-year-old man who gets into boxing. So he wants a sketch that has something to do with boxing. And then it's like, okay, let me try to come up with, like, three funny sketches that involve Brian Cranston and, and like, an older guy getting into boxing. Um, so in Late Night, it's very... There is, there is sometimes like open world thinking in, in, or like blue sky thinking in like in late night, you know, which we'll spend a lot of time doing on Fridays. Like, so, you know, there's this bit we do on the show called Crosswalk the Musical, which I came up with, which is where we will put on like a Broadway musical in like a 30 second crosswalk. And that idea occurred to me because I was walking from Cantor's, which is a Jewish deli on Fairfax in Los Angeles, back to our studio. And there's also a lot of Orthodox Jews in that neighborhood. And I was crossing the crosswalk and I was like, wouldn't it be funny to do Fiddler on Fairfax? And then that came into, oh, you guys have seen it. So a couple of you have seen it. Thank you. I'm really glad you like it. Uh, <laughs> and that was the whole creative process for it. It was like, oh shit, it would be James is a Tony winning, you know, Broadway actor. Let's put him in his like, let's take what he's good at and then put it into like a sketch that we can put on late night. Um, and and then the more you work in late night, the more it will occur to you what works. And I guess like the thing about late night writing and variety in general is like you are writing to someone's talents. And that is a circumstance where the, the it's sometimes it's nice to have constraints on your creativity or at least a framework, you know what I mean? Like it's like, all right, I know James Corden isn't going to do a Seth Meyers closer look because nobody wants to hear from like this jovial British song and dance man, you know, I mean, about like a Flint water crisis or they do, but like he's not an authoritative voice on that kind of thing, you know? So I know I'm not going to do that, but I do know that like 
he's got a like a really good singing voice. He can dance extraordinarily well for a guy who's like 230 pounds. And like, and you know, he's got this skill set. He loves West Side Story. So let's do this, blah, 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 blah. And when you mix those together, you're like, it's like a, you know, when you're writing for talent, it's like a chopped basket basically. And you know, you have these four ingredients and it's a little easier to think of what the, what the <laughs> recipe is going to be, if that makes any sense. Um, so those are my various creative processes. Um, Summer, you have a question? I do have a question. Um, I'm going to cheat and make it too. Um, oh. But the first part is, I like you talked about how the first time you moved to LA, it was very much like sitting in Starbucks really late, like just grinding by yourself and like working at P.F. Chang's, which yeah. I feel yeah. like is a story you hear a lot, like especially in comedy of just like all of my favorite comedians just moved to Queens and waitressed for however long until they got a random gig that shot them to success, which I feel yeah. like really goes against what we learned in college of like apply for all these internships in the summer <laughs> and like work your way up the food chain and whatever. Um, so I'm curious to get your take on that and just like, obviously you only have your experience, which is like one half of that story, but is yeah. one more effective or I don't know. I don't know. It's inter It's interesting. I mean, as far as like in stand up comedy goes, um, there's like, no matter what your previous experience is, you have to, go to open mics, you have to read, write, and or you have to watch, write, and perform as much as possible. That, that's what, like with stand-up comedy. I'm sure that translates somewhat to other uh, disciplines, but like no matter what kind of apartment you're going back to at the end of the night, whether it's like you and 12 other people in a flop house or you know what I mean? Like, you're, like your day job is as an attorney or whatever, like, you know, Greg Giraldo and like, may he rest in peace was like a lawyer before he got into stand-up comedy and like I got was working at the Netflix call center in Beaverton Oregon you know from 3 30 in the morning until noon when I got into stand-up comedy so like I guess I guess that really depends on like what you want to get into ultimately no matter what you want to do in entertainment and no matter what you're doing when you decide that you have to find a way to treat it like work um before it becomes work, you know, like you, that just, you, you, you just have to, that was, if I could, you know, when I started in stand up in Portland, there were like probably about four or five of us who were all as funny as one another. And you get lucky. Listen, that's like, there's a lot of people who like make it quote unquote, who are going to say it was hard work. It was all hard work. And like, it was hard work, but then also they got lucky six times, but it's like, they say like, you know, luck is opportunity meets preparation. Like the big difference between me and like a couple of the other people who now aren't doing comedy anymore or who are not doing it on maybe like as big, don't have as big of a platform. In addition to the few lucky breaks was like, you know, I spent more time working on it. I, I did like treat it like a job kind of before it became a job. And again, also I got very lucky and you know, that's, also very true but like the, you can't control that what you can control is like treating it like work so I don't know like internships and stuff like that that can be that can also give you like really good opportunities and as long as you're like doing that internship and then also spending all this time like working on your craft whatever that craft may be um maybe those like internship or whatever it is will, will make it easier for you to like have those relationships that do sort of foster that lucky break that you need, you know, or that opportunity to come along and stuff like that. Um, and like in stand up, yeah, you do hear a lot of the stories about like people, you know, uh, going to go, you know, like humping like a shitty restaurant job and like going to mics at night and stuff like that. But like, it wasn't the shitty restaurant job. It was the open mics at night that did it, you know, Although the shitty restaurant job might give you life experience to write about, and that's really good. And that way you don't get stuck up entertainment's ass the whole job where you're like, day job is reading scripts at Comedy Central. Then at night you're like going out and like doing stand up. Although I've no comics who also did that, who then became successful. Like, you know, Claire Mullaney, who's John Mullaney's sister, I think worked at Comedy Central before or like something like that. And like, 
is now also a successful comedy writer. So there's a lot of different paths to doing it. Um, you just have to make sure you, you do it, you know, uh, if that makes sense. And you had another question? Yeah, that uh, it kind of segues into like when you were talking about how it is to some degree luck. Obviously, you're a writer now. How did you make that jump from like doing stand up to you got your first job writing for TV? I was at uh, Just for Laughs in Montreal, and there was a show called Chelsea Lately that was on like seven or eight years ago, and like for a decade before that or so. And their talent booker, it was a panel show, which we don't have a ton of in America, which is a bummer, but they have a ton of in England. Um, it was a panel show, so three comedians would be on with Chelsea and they would talk about stories and you don't, you'd each get like two jokes off. And their talent booker saw me do stand up and asked me if I wanted to be one of the comedians on their panel. And I did. And then I did, I did well on it. You know, I spent like, a day writing jokes for all these stories that they email you and then went in and like did the jokes. And this was the lucky break. This was a like, like I like I've lost a bunch of weight recently, but I used to be, you know, a pretty, like pretty big dude. I weighed like 350 pounds and Chelsea kind of fetishizes people with weird body shapes. <laughs> and so like, a, I I was really, really funny. She kind of fetishized people with weird body shapes. So they like, I took care of one thing. That's a weird stroke of luck or whatever you want to call it. And then the other stroke of luck was they happened to need a writer and a panelist on that show. So when I went in, she thought I was funny. She thought I was interesting and they needed to hire somebody. So I got hired on that show during the very last year of that show, which uh, gave me a lot of reps. Like, and also in, a, in like, a very low pressure environment, which was really good. This actually happened earlier in my career in Portland, Oregon too. I did like a basketball post game show for the Blazers where I would like tell jokes about the Blazers with like, there'd be a former Blazer, a sports writer, a host and me. And then I got to go be on live TV like 150 times with a total of 150 people watching. So that was very lucky. But uh, Chelsea let me like learn how to write for a daily television show that we knew was going to be off the air in a year and not because it wasn't successful. So we have like a huge budget, no pressure and no chance of me getting fired. Cause why are you going to fire somebody if you're going to be off the air? You know what I mean? In like six months. So that was very lucky. And I had a resume. Um, and then my next job was, well, I did a pilot for ABC that I wrote, but then my next job was on Corden. And basically the way that happened was my agent, there was a new late night show starting up. My agent set up a meeting with me and Corden, and I went in with a notebook full of ideas for late night. Stuff that like showed I was thinking about it, but uh, I mean like nothing we would ever do on the show now. Like if I came in, which is crazy, like if I came in with my packet right now that I got hired off of, I wouldn't hire me, which is like crazy. And maybe speaks to me being a bad head writer or something, but like, one of these ideas was we would have a time machine on the stage and like we would have like sketch actors playing like Shakespeare come out and sit on the couch and shit like that. And now if you've seen our show at all, which is very glossy and produced, like that's nothing we would do, but it is something I wanted to see in like late nights. So um, yeah, when it, like the first time was because of stand up, and then I just had a good meeting. And the second time was I just had a giant packet full of ideas that showed if you hire me, maybe it's none of these ideas, but I will give you like 30 ideas by the end of the day. And I'm, I am gonna work hard, you know? And um, that's how I got my second job. But it was like a stroke of luck both times, you know, you needed like, they needed to be hiring and I happened to be there. And then another late night show was starting. And like, I was, I was one of the people who came in for a meeting. It could have been any number of stand-up comedians, but I got lucky there. Um, Asia, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, my internet sucks, so just making sure. Um, my question is, uh, I'm from Eugene, like I live, I've lived in Oregon my whole life, nice. and the thought of moving to LA is like overwhelming, and so I kind of want to try out Portland, because like that's 
like something that's more like realistic and I still get like the beautiful trees and the nature and all that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, I know you were in stand up in Portland, but do you, being a part of the entertainment industry up there and even that kind of capacity, do you think it's realistic to like have a legitimate job up there? Like, cause I know there's like shrill and like grim and like Portlandia, like, but those are rare. So I was just wondering what your take on that was. Yeah, it's like, I mean, my experience in being in the arts community in Portland, I bet is like fairly similar to what it's like in Eugene, although maybe on a bigger scale, like all the people I knew, there were a few people I knew who only did ent entertainment, you know, um, but everyone else I knew had like five different jobs and they were like all kind of fun. And, and I guess the way they like identified themselves was by the one that they cared about the most. You know what I mean? You would be like somebody who would work in film and then they also work three days a week at this coffee shop. And then they, uh, you know, twice a week they're at new seasons in the, in the bakery. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. So I, I think, I think you, you can, I think you can work in the industry. I definitely know people who like work crew on like shrill and like stuff like that. And, uh, I know they bring up a lot of the creatives from like LA and New York and do a lot of like the casting like that, unfortunately, but like a lot of the crew, yeah, they like were local people. I was on an episode of Portlandia early on and the director was from LA and like, you know, maybe, I mean, the writer was definitely from LA, but like everyone else on the crew was like local or like Portland people. So I think you, I think you can do it. And I think, you know, like, that's the kind of show. I, I think it's a great idea to move to Portland instead of instead of like Los Angeles right off the bat. And I mean, this is me speaking as a stand-up comedian, but like, I I don't know. Like, it's it's harder to do stuff down here, at least in stand-up anyway. And I think with like other projects too, it can be like hard to do stuff down here because all the best people are doing it down here, you know. And that's awesome when you get to the point when you can like be amongst those people doing it and that's and that's and that's really great but like you get to be one of those people by doing it and like portland might be like a better place to actually get to do it to like get your reps in or whatever that other like mid-tier city is it doesn't have to be portland you know like it can be so many different places but like yeah you know don't don't feel bad if if you're not right off the bat like paying all your bills with with uh, your creative outlet but I think it's more important to like get reps in and whatever that creative outlet is as many as possible than it is to be like able to pat yourself on the back and say like, you know, I don't have to work at this shitty restaurant. Work at the shitty restaurant if it means you get to do what you love more often. I, that's what I think, especially right now when like, like when I was doing it, there was much less of a chance that I would get seen by people in LA and New York when I was in, in Portland. But like now if you make something rad, no matter where you live, you know, like it's going to get seen, you know, if something blows up on the internet and you filmed it in Hillsdale, Oregon or whatever, like they're still going to see it in Los Angeles and New York, like if it's really good. So I think it's more important to get the reps in than to come right to the big city. But again, that's just me speaking as a stand up, and your mileage may vary completely. Um, I think we'll take a few more questions. Um, okay. Lily, you got a question? Yeah, I was just kind of wondering what it's like, because obviously you've built a repertoire with um, James Corden and like writing the jokes and you know how he's going to deliver them. So what is it like when there's a guest host on the show in writing the jokes, especially when there's like a last minute one, like when Harry Styles had to be on the show because James was having his baby. I was actually at that show and so was Lena, who's in the Zoom. Very exciting, very oh, fun day. Amazing. So I'm just curious what it's like when you have to write last minute jokes or just new jokes for a uh, host that you maybe don't know how they're necessarily going to be able to deliver them. Well, Harry's a prick. He screamed at us and berated <laughs> us for an hour. No, he was so fun. <laughs> he's so nice. Um, he's an awesome dude. It's it's interesting when that happened. You just like you, you you. It really depends. So like when Harry hosted, like last minute, like that. It's it's let's let's make this. Uh, let's put him in as no matter who it is. You want to put them in the biggest position to succeed that you can. So with Harry, who's very charming, very charismatic, and like a good performer, but not someone who's ever done stand-up or done a monologue before, you want to write 
a few very self-aware jokes for him. And then you want to give him some very like uh, basic jokes, you know, like a few basic jokes. And you want to protect those people. You know what I mean? Like James Corden can go out there and tell a bunch of jokes about like Trump or whatever, blah, 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 because he's a late night host, you know. Uh, he can tell jokes that would get other celebrities like into, into trouble on the internet if they went out and did it. So you want to like put them in a position to succeed and then also protect them because they're there doing you a favor. Um, now, last year when James was working on, uh, he was working on a movie. So he missed like the like four shows or it was eight shows uh, heading into the holidays. And we had people like, you know, Chance the Rapper and Melissa McCarthy and uh, a few other people come in and guest host. When that happens, your work, uh, Jeff Goldblum, I think hosted one. Then you're uh, kind of working based on how much that celebrity wants to be involved in the process. Some of them, when Brian Cranston guest hosted, he wanted us to give him a traditional late night monologue because he wanted to do, he thought it would be really fun to do a late night monologue and he was amazing at it. And I'm very lucky he doesn't want to do it for a living because I'd be out of a job if he did. He's so good at it. Um, and then Melissa McCarthy wanted to do some weird esoteric like sketch monologue where her like outfit was covered in like ornaments or like something like that. So then you you write to what the celebrity wants. It's Chance wanted to do like just a couple of jokes, I think, and like not really like spend a ton of time on the monologue. Um, so then it's you you become, you know, like uh, you're a cook working off the menu more than a chef. You know what I mean? Like they tell you what they want and then you you like make that for them. And then when they realize that's not what they want, you make something else. But like, uh, yeah, it's very catering it to the talents of that specific celebrity. Um, so yeah, and with Harry, you know, you like with Harry, we, you can kind of build that what that monologue was gonna be in your head. There's gonna be one or two jokes about James not being there, another joke about Harry being there, you know, a joke about Harry being handsome, a joke about Harry being charming, uh, you know, and then like a joke about One Direction. And then by that point, you're four minutes in, because also you had to account for the minutes all of screaming, like when he first walked out. And then like, and then you're done with your monologue, then you can get into the show and stuff like that. And you're kind of off to the races. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions in the room? Um, I'll, I have one more question. Um, I was curious about how you like now with this job that seems really like time consuming, how you balance your professional career with also like your personal stand up uh, oh, yeah. and creative processes. Uh, I don't very well. <laughs> like, this is when I was j uh, just a regular writer, I was a little bit better at, well, first of all, stand up isn't even here anymore. So like, I mean, for the time being, people are doing Zoom shows, it'll be back. I'll figure out a way to do it again then. Um, I, I am not very good at balancing it. Being like a head writer is a all consuming job. Like I have work to do after this. Like, so, um, but I will answer any of your questions cause I'd much rather be doing this and I'll just find another way to procrastinate uh, if, I, if I'm not doing this. So it's, it's, it's tough. It's a, when we were in the studio, it was a 60 hour a week job, you know, and like, and and now that we're not it's a little bit easier but like it's these i mean these jobs are hard you know they're like the in entertainment they're hard they like a lot of them pay a lot of money and like seem glamorous and they are and those things are true but like you know they the rewards do come with like a lot of work and it's it's hard to do that i would try to do as much stand-up as i could um but there were times i would have to listen to my own stand-up record to remind myself what my comedic voice was so I wasn't like writing stand-up in James Corden's voice and like stuff like that you know um so it takes it takes like a lot of discipline I mean it takes a lot like my girlfriend is like writes for tv and has like written books and like and does a podcast as well and like what do you, you like set an actual schedule for yourself right yeah, and stuff. Really good she it's really she like sets an actual schedule for herself where it's like all right from like eight to noon i'm going to be working on like this book and then lunch and then like 
you know, like that kind of thing. And you have to have like that kind of discipline to be doing like one for them, one for you, uh, at least from a writing standpoint goes. Um, Summer had another question in the chat um, about how did you get connected with your agent? Oh yeah. So I had a manager um, from me coming to Los Angeles to do stand-up comedy um, and just performing in as many shows as I could. And my manager then, when I went to Montreal, set up a bunch of meetings with like CAA and WME and all the other agencies and stuff. And then that part was kind of fun. Then they all take you out to dinner and like blow smoke up your ass so they can take 10% of every check you make in perpetuity. When like, it was a dirty trick, it was really fun. It was a fun dirty trick, but like the people I ended up signing with like brought me, I did like, I've had like a fine career so far, but like when I was at Montreal, I was like, I had like a really good new face set and like got written up and all this stuff. So I was like a hot commodity. So they set it up. So Dave Chappelle had the meeting right before me. So like he was leaving and then they were all like laughing together, you know, while I was like sitting there in the waiting room and then they left and then they were like, Ian, you know, come on in. So like I ended up signing with them. So that was like a really fun, like, like show busy type thing. Um, but yeah, I just like, I got them from Montreal. When you became a new face, you pretty much signed with an agent, uh, which I imagine would be like getting, having like a film at a festival do well. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't see anyone else's hands raised. So, um, but so I think that there's no more questions. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Ian. We yeah, my pleasure. We're so excited to have you. Um, I'm super, super excited to have you um, join us for club this week. Yeah, I wish you. All, I wish you all all the luck. Uh, did, did, any more questions or anything like that? Okay, cool. I my last thing I'll say is like it's it is like it's a lot of hard work and it takes like hard work and luck and all that stuff. But there are moments, you know, and like day to day, it feels like work no matter what you're doing no matter how cool the job is like whatever you're going to do it's going to feel like work from day to day but there'll be moments when you're like standing backstage and there's like crew moving lights you know and like a last second script revision happening and like you know will smith is dressed up like a genie or whatever the fuck and you're like oh my god this is my job and you get to work every day with people who want to make that stuff as bad as you do and it's so worth it. It's so worth it. It's just worth worth all the hard work. And like, it's so much fun. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. I really, I really enjoyed it. Go Ducks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope I, I hope I run into some of you down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You so thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Dang. <laughs> yeah that was really i'm really excited that he was able to join us and he had a lot of really interesting um advice to give everyone so um yeah thank you guys all for joining us for club this week um remember we have club next week with the equipment training and um the promotional video next week after club so um remember to keep following us on instagram all that kind of stuff um thank you everyone for joining Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Bye, Thanks, everyone. Hannah, Thanks, that was Hannah. awesome. That was so Good job. Good job. Highlight of my life. Good job. It made me rethink my career. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Hannah. Bye, guys. Hannah, did you want me to stay after club? Yeah, we were going to chat a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Hannah, you could probably end the recording. Oh, yeah. Thanks. I forgot about that.